Hey everyone, this is Patrick Donahoe. Thanks uh, for joining us, uh, us. And if you're on video, if you're on YouTube, uh, you're uh, actually seeing us as well. So I'm here uh, with no stranger to the podcast, uh, Connor Boyack. And uh, we're going to get uh, a really interesting perspective on the theme that we've been discussing all season, which is uh, capitalism. So for those of you who are listening that are, that are new, uh, and haven't heard Connor on before. Connor uh, is the president of the Libertas Institute, which is a Utah-based organization whose mission is to, I love this, clear the path of opportunity for each Utah by removing obstacles that limit freedom. Uh, and they do a lot of legal research, public advocacy, and advertising, uh, but they also uh, do uh, lawsuits against government, events, publications, uh, and more. Uh, but Connor is also the author of a very popular series, which I believe you have uh, ten books or nine books now. Nine, going nine, on ten. Which are which is uh, called the Tuttle Twins series, which are children's books that uh, that teach the uh, principles of liberty in a variety of different contexts. And you just told me that you have surpassed the half a million mark in books. So that we that we will later this year. We're approaching Jeez. half a million, and and just amazing and like, you're the publisher you're the right you do and i know you have an illustrator as well yeah right? it's just been a labor of love and it's it's awesome well i hear about it uh all the time just in speaking to people that know you and know those books and so yeah you told me you sat next to ron paul once right and yeah that was kind of your in to get him yeah. liven up in the conversation oh it was amazing it was like because it was later at night and we were at dinner right uh -huh. so he was he was pretty you know he's pretty tired and this like he beamed and i was when i talked about uh, you and what you were doing so <laughs> You, awesome. You've struck a chord in a number of different ways, That's but, cool. uh, but you recently just got off uh, a legislative session, which is one of your busiest times of year yeah. uh, in Utah. And, you know, I think it's going to be interesting, this uh, interview around capitalism, because the perspective you have, I think, really creates a, uh, a unique way to look at some of the principles we've been discussing this season, because number one, you know, you're you're in front of lawmakers with which oftentimes don't understand the principles of capitalism right. and vote to protect people, but at the same time violate freedom, uh, freedoms, individual freedoms. Uh, but then you also write at a children's level about principles that most adult adults <laughs> don't understand, and so I think that's really I, I think it's unique because. The way you would speak about it is is different than how others speak about it. But I just wanted to you know take a second and you know express my appreciation for what you do. I mean, you Thanks. you face lots of adversity standing for principles of freedom, and I know it's uh, not easy sometimes. But you know you've taken a, a huge responsibility on you, and you're making a you're making a difference. It, it's fun. I mean, I, I I think about it this way. Like for your topic, uh, Pat, that we got we've got capitalism, and we can write books about it and we can read books about it and and so there's capitalism in theory as i like to call it and then i guess there's capitalism in the trenches yeah <laughs> right like it's one thing to read like sun tzu the art, art of, of war, war right and be like yeah i would totally do that strategy and i would do this and then when you actually get in war you're like oh crap how does this actually work <laughs> and so i think capitalism is a lot that way like at a high level yeah there are very important principles that i subscribe to like by no means am i saying that the theory is bad. It's it's you know spot on. The problem is the real world is messy, and mm -hmm. you have to interact with people who uh, have political power or economic power and don't necessarily subscribe to the same principles. Mm -hmm. And and how do you do that in a way that actually preserves uh, capitalism and free markets and liberty and all that kind of stuff? Uh, that that's where like the rubber meets the road, and it's kind of tough to see how it plays out. Yeah, and that's where. I like the way you approach things is when, you know, it, when certain things inhibit individual rights, that tends, right, to be where you go on the attack or yeah. the, on the offensive. Yeah. No, I, th I think that's important because so often we're on the defense, right? And I'm always trying to figure out, like, what are the ways that we can strategically pivot? So an example is um, we had recently, uh, this is actually a few years ago, when Uber and Lyft came to town. People mm -hmm. have heard this story play out all over the, mm -hmm. the country, taxis, fighting, and so forth. And we found a single mom who was driving with Lyft mm -hmm. in Salt Lake City. And uh, she, was, she was cited with a $6,500 ticket for picking someone up at the airport. <laughs> like, just insane. Like, where you go, you go speed 100 miles an hour over the limit and not get a ticket that much. And here she was just doing this consensual, you know, whatever thing. 
And so we can, she can play defense or, or Uber and Lyft, you know, on behalf of their clients can, can play defense and try and, you know, get, fight the ticket, get it stopped. Or we can use that as leverage to go on the offense and shame the airport, right? And, and use the court of public opinion and use lawsuits. And so with us, it's always, what are those stories that we can find where, where the free market is being undermined, right? Where people are trying to just do business and mm -hmm. the government is standing in the way. And how can we proactively try and fight it? Um, and, and the benefit with a lot of these cases that we might dig into is that there's a lot of sympathy for like Uber and Lyft or mm -hmm. for Airbnb or for food trucks. I mean, we, we did this event a couple of years ago called the Rally for Food Truck mm -hmm. Freedom. And we had about 2,000 people come up. Uh, we had a, a dozen, I mean, in the rain and everything, we had 2,000 people show up. A uh, dozen food trucks, it was amazing. And the whole thing happening was in our state, uh, food trucks were being heavily regulated. Many were going out of business because in here in Utah, as you know, we have this, uh, this valley where all the cities are clustered together mm -hmm. and like 80% of our state's population is within that valley. Yeah. And so there's all these cities just kind of pegged together rather than being kind of separate, right? Mm -hmm. And so the food trucks catering to the market are just going everywhere in between. They've got a lunch here and a dinner here and the next day they'll be in another city. And what was happening before is that the government was, was requiring an inspection in every city, fees in every city, licenses. City governments, the city governments. The city governments. And so you were having to do this, this redundant regulations and inspections and costs and the costs alone, like if you're selling food, you're on a razor thin profit margin, yeah. right? And now if you're having to pay all this money to the government just for permission to go operate. Anyway, so it was just ridiculous. And yeah. these guys were going out of business. So we do this big uh, food truck event. We had all the media come. It was amazing. We had all these TV crews come out. And these reporters are like eating food on camera That's and amazing. saying how much they love food trucks. <laughs> and leveraging that public opinion to shame these cities so that when we went to the legislature to fix the law, uh, there was no question. I mean, that law passed super easy because we had... Uh, kind of got on the offense in a way that built public support and pressure to get the law changed. So let's talk. Let's talk about w why they wanted to impose those, uh, you know, those those regulations having to do inspections, get yeah. licenses, or whatever. Like, what what's the driving force behind that? So uh, fear and laziness. Let me break those down. <laughs> So uh, I've answered a question like this a time or two because yeah. we deal with this problem all the time. So with fear, it's, well, we don't know, are they going to sell unhealthy food? And, you know, we got to inspect it, People we got to regulate sick. it. And, right. And so that's, that's the fear-based approach to regulation that in the mind of the uh, elected officials and the bureaucrats justifies all these types of regulatory yeah. issues, right? And to some extent, I mean, we can agree, like, okay, we, we want certification, we want inspection Maybe the market can do that rather mm -hmm. than the government, yeah. but that's a separate question. But on, on the surface level, we all want you know healthy food only to be sold. So we're fine there um, at, at that superficial level. So, so fear is what creates the desire for the regulation. Um, laziness is the other one. And what I mean by that is, it's not like within the past five years when food trucks really exploded, all these cities said, we need to regulate these things and we need to make this redundant patchwork that they're going to have to like, no, that didn't happen. This was just decades old laws on the books that weren't dynamic enough to apply Test. to this new business model. And that's what we see time and again with Tesla trying to do business and Airbnb and mm -hmm. all this kind of stuff. You got these regulations and you have inertia in the system that does not respond. It's not agile. It's yeah. not agile enough. And so then you got these new innovative business models that are being crammed down these regulatory frameworks and mazes that were built for a totally different system. And I think laziness plays a big part. When we go in and shine a big spotlight at this arcane maze and say, why are we making these entrepreneurs go through there? It's a bit easier for elected officials to be like, oh yeah, that looks awful. I wouldn't want mm -hmm. to do that. But I think there's a lot of inertia. And unless you have people stepping forward and making the case and raising an opportunity to say, let's fix that, it doesn't get fixed because these food truck owners didn't know how to change the law. They, yeah, didn't, no. they didn't know what to do. They, and so when we came on the scene and said, we're going to help shine the spotlight, they were Im immensely grateful. I eat free at every food truck I go to from now on because I say, amazing. hey, we're the group that did that. Oh, here, you know, let me, <laughs> let me serve you. So they're very happy. But, you know, the lay person doesn't know how to do this kind of stuff. And so you get this inertia and silos where this business is regulated this way. This entrepreneur just slogs through the system because they don't know how to change it. Um, and, you know, very few politicians are enterprising enough to find those problems and then come up with solutions. So what's the, so what would you say the general consensus is of 
of, of lawmakers with these issues. Because I think, you know, it's, it's interesting. You have new businesses, entrepreneurs that are disrupting, finding better ways to do things, which oftentimes may not be, you know, uh, perfectly in line with the existing laws, right? Yeah. Uh, but you also have big business that, or established businesses that, uh, you know, they believe they're operating, you know, in a free market. That's how they were created. But maybe they haven't innovated and they're starting to get disrupted and then use political influence to block certain oh, know, yeah. certain things to uh, or certain businesses from from competing with them. So yep. how do you, like where do you see the general consensus of of, you know, lawmakers when it comes down to those two, I would say, two opposing forces in a sense? The hard part is. Uh, and this is such a, a com, uh, relevant and compelling question because it happens over and over again. We have a, a problem that is the average lawmaker is ignorant. And I don't mean that in a pejorative way. It's just that, especially in a citizen legislature that meets part time, they've got jobs, they've got families, they've got hobbies. And now within a 45 day session, a 60 day session, they're just bombarded with information. And, and so you're literally talking to elected officials in bullet points. Like the most effective way to get someone to pay attention and change their mind or vote the way you want is a one pager, little summary with bullet points. And, and that's the, the level to which the average lawmaker can go on any issue. So then the problem to, to your question becomes when they get confused, because what will happen, I'll give you a very uh, precise example that we dealt with this session. So there's a newer company called Turo. Have you heard of them yeah, before? Yeah, I've, I've used them. Before. Okay, so yeah. you rent cars, right? Yeah, yeah. It's really car sharing between yeah. you and the person. So you want to... Is it a Model, uh, model X? Yeah, Tesla. you, you want to do Tesla, you want to get a Hummer, you want to get a Lamborghini for yeah. the day, yeah. right? Uh, people in your area who have that car can share it with you yeah. and, and so forth. So um, who doesn't like that? Well, the rental car companies. Of course. Who have a ton of influence and a ton of money. So they hire lobbyists. And this happened in Utah. We had a bill that was trying to uh, deregulate and protect uh, the ability of Turo and companies like them to innovate because they're getting shut down. And just like uh, Uber and Lyft were, you have Turo drivers right now being criminalized, uh, criminally charged Jeez. and prosecuted for picking people up uh, at the airport. And so what happens then is the rental car companies get their lobbyists to go up to the Capitol where these superficial, ignorant voters are that can only you know understand things in bullet points by and large, uh, just because there's so much information to absorb about every bill. And then you get them uh, going to committee or going to talk to the legislature and say, oh, we're the free market approach. And, and all we want is fairness. We just want a fair playing field. <laughs> and, and you're trying to let these guys you know, they're not paying all these taxes that we are and they're not doing all these other things that we are. It's so unfair. And that's very persuasive to a lawmaker. It's oh, yeah. like, well, I believe in a fair playing field. Hey, Turo, why should we let? Well, no, it's because the, the lobbyists for the big companies know very well how to spin things in a way that sounds good huh. to a, an ignorant lawmaker who can't dedicate a lot of time. But then when you have the ability to go in there and counter, you say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. They're claiming they want a fair uh, playing field. What they didn't tell you is that all the cars that they uh, buy for their fleet, they don't pay sales tax on. They get a sales tax exemption, saving a profound amount of money. So we're totally fine to talk fair playing field if they're willing to give up that exemption or give it to our driver. Uh, 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 you know, <laughs> and, and that's the problem is that there's not a lot of great opportunity for lawmakers to really dig in and say, okay, what do you say to that? Okay, well, what do you say to that? Let's try and really kind of get into it. And so it's it's talking points, it's superficial one pagers and bullet points, and the average lawmaker can't simply by virtue of how the process works dedicate the amount of time to fully understand the issues. And so that's when you get these big companies uh, who are protected by the status quo being able to divert lawmakers into saying, "Oh no, you know, we want a fair playing field, so we're not going to pass this bill that helps Turo." And then Turo and freedom fighters like us on the sidelines are like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, that's not how it works. But by then the bill's dead and then, you know, they have a year head start to keep doing whatever they're doing. So what ended up happening with Turo? Uh, so that bill, that bill, that particular bill. So the, what the bill did that we said, by and large, is we said, look, if you're a government and you want to regulate a company like Turo or any other peer-to-peer -peer company, you have to treat them differently than the type of business that they're disrupting. So for example, you have to treat the company Turo differently than you treat enterprise or Hertz or rental car companies that own vehicles and own parking lots and buildings because uh, apps, peer-to-peer -peer apps like Turo are like a matchmaking service. Yeah. They matched you with the Model X yeah. guy, right? 
Uh, that's all they are. They don't have inventory, they don't have sales. Same thing, uh, Airbnb is not a hotel. Uber is not a taxi service. So we have this like model framework saying, just treat them differently. We're not telling you how, mm -hmm. but what we're saying is, you can't go to Turo or whatever new peer-to-peer -peer app comes online and say, ha, you have to abide by these old regulations. We just were trying to say in law, create a separate path because they're different. And everyone freaks out and loses their mind and they narrowed the bill and amended it down to nothing and then it ended up not passing. Oh man. Yeah. Well, in a free market pro-business state, no less. No kidding. <laughs> and that's where, so what do you, what, as, as society, as the U.S. continues to, as the world continues to innovate, I mean, Turo is like, you rent your car out to somebody else. It, it's not this like revolutionary, life-changing idea. Yeah. When those actually are presented, how have you, how you, how have you been able to think through, think through that as far as how you would approach some sort of like, life-changing treatment, right? I know stem cells and that type of therapy is getting really, really big, yep. but yet it freaks a lot of people, a lot of people out. Um, but it could be revol it could be revolutionary for, for health purposes. So how do you I mean, how do you kind of reconcile your ability to have conversations with legislators that can't necessarily understand the principles of, you know, a simple service like Turo? Yeah, no, it's tough. And I mean, to, to the latter point you bring out with the stem cells, mm -hmm. I've got a friend who's flying down to Mexico because that's where you got to go to get this innovative therapy. Like we have a choice in America as, as a once in theory or to some larger degree free market capitalist society that embraced innovation that is now veered far more towards socialist redistribution, uh, pro-regulation. That you know we we have to make a decision. And there's a fantastic book uh, called. Permissionless Innovation. Hmm. This is by Adam uh, Thierer, Thierer, I can never pronounce his last name, at the Mercatus Institute. Okay. And it's all about documenting how our society has been improved, especially through internet tech technologies, where you had a bit of this wild, wild west, mm -hmm. right? The, the lack of regulation stimulated this innovation where people could experiment and fail and succeed and all these things that really have benefited collectively all our lives. There's been some pain, there's been some loss, but no one can argue uh, that we haven't benefited as a society by the profound innovation that's been able to happen. And so his argument is that rather than a presumption of regulation, which is what our society has really adopted, mm. collectively speaking, uh, rather than the presumption of regulation, we should have a presumption of innovation. We should have permissionless, he calls it, permissionless innovation, where you don't, as an entrepreneur, have to first go and fill out form you know, 1093X, and then you have to go over here and get yeah. a permission slip, and dot your eyes and cross your teeth, just go innovate and go, as long as you're not hurting anyone, everything's fine, you pass some simple little check or whatever, and then go innovate. And so the, the problem as, uh, to your question is um, lawmakers need to become comfortable with that. And so what we're trying to figure out in our state, but then more broadly to message this is, how do you get lawmakers to embrace permissionless innovation? How do you get them to abandon the two issues uh, that I talked about, fear and laziness? How do you get them to care? And how do you get them to have faith rather than fear? And, and, and I think part of that is storytelling by say, hey, show me that phone in your pocket. That's a result of permissionless innovation. Imagine if the government had said that before coming up with a new cell phone, you must do all these things. Would Apple have done that? Would their competitors have done that? Would that have sparked all the, the, the race of innovation that has accelerated new technologies and new things that we take for granted? So using stories and examples to get lawmakers comfortable with a presumption of innovation, I think, is where we need to get to. And we're just internally mm, with our organization trying to figure out how do you how do you give them that comfort so that when enterprise or when the hotels or when the, the protectionist incumbents come to them and say, we need protection, we need you know regulation, you can have a lawmaker who says, no, I support capitalism, I support free markets, I understand you may not like it, but we're gonna go this path instead. And I look at you know our, where we're at as a as a society with the, especially the fiscal situation that we're in right now as a country, uh, as well as how our monetary system operates, the you know, issues with uh, government, uh, you know, mostly federal, federal government deficits, and how much uh, debt is on the books, debt that they're in for, with uh, other countries, mm -hmm. uh, as, well as, as well as us, uh, the Federal Reserve. And then you also look at uh, just the, the unfunded obligations, Social Security, Medicare. I mean, there's there's a there's a lot of, of issues out there, yeah. and I look at the future. And without innovation, if things just slowly sputtered along, 
uh, there's going to be a, a, a lot of heartache. And technology is really where innovation occurs because the idea of technology is to be more efficient. Yeah. Right. And in a free market, if, if you don't have a technology that actually makes a person's life better, right, or reduces the amount of time or reduces the amount of money, uh, it, it, it's going to fail really quickly. Yep. Right. So if you, when you start to stifle innovation, uh, that's when you know, the future is going to get really rocky. And so that's interesting. I've never heard of that book before, but it, it makes sense because it's, like I said, it's like if, you, if you're having a hard time with Turo, right, what, what about a life-changing medical procedure? Right. What about, you know, the medical, you know, marijuana thing that you've been dealing with? It's, it's one of those things where there's, it's happening, life is happening so quickly. Yeah. And if government starts to put their, you know, their, their foot on the brakes, it can be bad for, for everyone. One of the challenges is that because economics and politics are inherently intertwined, you know, you, you've got all these regulations and laws that are encumbering the market. We don't, we've never had a truly free market. Never, right? we, no, can, uh-uh. we can talk about wanting one and how they're great, but yeah. we've always had this regulated market. And politicians respond to pressure, whether that's like angry mob pressure or just people demanding things and saying we want this and looking at the polls. And I think part of our challenge, to be very frank, is that a lot of people are acclimatized to the status quo. It's very hard to quantify everything you just mentioned, the unfunded ob- liabilities and the, the college debt bubble and like all these things that are kind of on the horizon. The numbers are so big, we can't even comprehend them anymore. It. To the lay person, there's no demand for change. And so consequently, there's no pressure being applied to lawmakers to figure out. If anything, it's the opposite. It's, yeah. I don't want to think about that. Yep. I don't want to touch it. I want my easy credit. I want the ability to get a loan, to and, finance my house. And put the burden on someone else. Put the burden on someone else. And that's where the demand is. So you have that perverse incentive for mm-hmm. lawmakers to ease the burden on the people who are directly in their ear. And the people who can't advocate, right, are the rising generation who we keep kicking the can down to. And I think that's part of the problem is when we had the food truck owners rallied together, when we had the Uber and Lyft drivers rallied together, we can go work together to create the right pressure to get things changed, to create a freer market, to get these bad regulations out of the way. When it comes to the big financial problems that you just listed, where's the mob? Where, where's the, the, the pitchforks? Where's the pressure? Mm-hmm. And, and I think if anything, as, as we were just discussing, there's almost the opposite incentive and uh, I think that's to our collective detriment because it's, it's creating a big problem. So th- this is kind of a tangent, but I was, so I was in uh, Italy a few, uh, few weeks ago and we were in a, a city and there's this massive protest and kids apparently left school mm. and they were uh, protesting uh, global warming. Mm. Uh, but in Italy, I don't know if you know much about what's going on there, but mm-hmm. they're you know, horribly uh, in, in debt and they're currently in a recession And a lot of it has to do with their government and the lack of accountability that's existed there. Mm. But yet they're processing global warming. Right. Right. So that's a that's something that I I think you're right. I think worldwide people right are so it's so uh, we've been so polarized with just status quo and how things should be. And it's been it's been exploited. I think part of it is kind of the bread and circuses uh, mentality of Rome. Right. Almost there's political bread and circuses. Global warming is itself a bit of political bread. It's, it's the hip thing to be excited about and it's what everyone wants to chatter about. But yeah, why don't they funnel that same political energy to go tackle the real problems that are actually threatening people? It's almost a, a convenient distraction for politicians to kind of look cool and say, I care about saving the world. Yeah. Save, save your country, save your budget. Like, it's like the Jordan Peterson, like clean your bedroom first and then go yeah. worry about other stuff, right? So I look at, you know, so kind of pivoting back, accountability is a huge piece of capitalism and it also seems like it's a huge piece based on uh, your your success obviously with capitalism the accountability is you know if you produce a bad product people are not going to buy it so therefore you're you have the incentive to actually produce something of value Mm -hmm. Uh, but when it comes to lawmakers it's it's interesting what you've done is you've created kind of a, a very similar environment so that they operate in a different uh, you know, idea, they operate in a different environment of accountability. So tell, you know, maybe talk about what you've done the last few years with uh, uh, creating kind of a lawmaker index. So uh, every year in our state, and, and other groups do this too, we, we by no means have innovated this, but we've created it to the point where it's very effective. Every year, um, the, the very night that the legislative session ends, we already have done and finalized our index scoring how they did so there's there's immediacy we're not waiting three weeks when everyone's back in their lives 
We get it out very quick, ranking all the, the best and the worst votes. And the benefit in doing this is we're first to market. So everyone's looking at our index. It's kind of the, the thing coming out the gate to kind of see how everyone did. So we get a lot of attention. And because we get a lot of attention on the index, that creates an incentive for lawmakers to want to do well so that they perform good. And so mm-hmm. Uh, all throughout the session, we'll have different lawmakers coming up to us and say, "Hey, how am I doing? How am I? Do, do you really? Absolutely. That's amazing. And like, hey, hey, I, like, <laughs> what has happened? We get little bonus points when they sponsor our bills because you know they're good free market bills or whatever. And we say, hey, if you run uh, one of these bills, you'll get some extra points. Or if you run a bad bill, you'll get negative points. And so we'll get lawmakers like, hey, I, I only did one bill uh, of yours last year. Do you have you know a couple more that we could do this year? And so. It, it's kind of like like I have a puppy right now, right? And you use the the treat to oh, incentivize yeah, to to the good behavior, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, you don't want them peeing on the couch, right? We don't want these politicians doing bad things, and so you got to wave the, the little incentive in front yeah. of them. By no means is it like the answer. I mean, oh. we a lot of them don't care. Some of them live in districts where uh, you know they're very liberal or, or or progressive or whatever, and they're not at all fans of the free market. They want these big socialist policies, and so those. Politicians in true representative form uh, don't really care about our index because they feel like they're representing their constituency well. Mm-hmm. So it's not like the answer across the board, but accountability is essential. Think when you go on Amazon to buy, you know, this Computer laptop or whatever. or whatever, you're going to see the ratings. You see what everyone thinks about it, what experience they've had with it. You can have confidence in your your decision to acquire uh, that commodity. Uh, why shouldn't the same thing happen with elected officials? Why mm-hmm. can't we see very conveniently their voting record? And how they've done on kind of the best and worst. How, how many times have they raised taxes? You know, how many bills have they sponsored that uh, protect the free market? That type of information leads to an informed consumer, mm-hmm. in, in the case of a commodity, or an informed voter. I can't tell you. I mean, I'm sure you get this too. You, you get to election day, and I, my phone just, I get all these texts come in from people saying, hey, I haven't looked at anything. Who should I vote for? And like, I didn't have time to study. Tell, tell me what to vote for. I, I kind of think like you. So, I'm like, <laughs> just don't vote like you know anyways the the concern is that we need to have i think informed voting informed consumers in the same way and we have a great thing going when it comes to uh just last night i took an uber drive and you can see the star rating from all the other drivers and you have and, one too and right and i have one too and so it's a self-policing system yeah. a great example where the market is kind of taking care of itself to yeah. weed out any bad actors um, why can't we have that in politics? We need we need more of it. Absolutely. Well, just because if you you know fundamentally isn't government about protecting you know free market principles and protecting individual rights? Okay, they're not there to actually solve problems. Yeah. Right. So if you look at you know really the innovation that I think is the it's the key to you know to the future inhibiting inhibiting that is going to be. Uh, it, it's going to be catastrophic. I also look at you know it essentially uh, technology replacing government in in a sense because right now we have the tools of accountability that government creates in the first place, mm-hmm. right? So whether it's permits for restaurants or whether it's uh, you know um, light, uh, even driver's licenses. I mean, there's a number number of different things mm-hmm. right that are, are currently uh, governed to protect people, but at the same time. There are a lot of free market tools that would most likely do a better job. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. The, the issue is there's always going to be those forces trying to dissuade the adoption of new technologies that are going to disrupt. I mean, I, I'll give you an example. When I was in the House of Representatives this uh, session and I lean over to my policy director and I made a comment to the effect that there's this woman, a clerk, whose job it is to read the name of every bill when it's time to vote. That's, that's her job. I'm like, you can automate that. They have digital, everything's digital, and yet this woman's still required to read. Just run that through like a Google, you know, voice transcription thing. Text to voice. Just, yeah, like super easy, super effective, and save, you know, 60 grand or whatever it costs to pay her. And, and, uh, and, and yet, you know, everyone in charge of the budget and on the staff loves that woman. And why would we want to let her go? She's great. So you have those perverse incentives always trying to inhibit the ability to, to progress. Well, it's yeah. That's that's the that's the nature of uh, of government. It's the Reagan or Ronald Reagan. You know, the the closest thing to eternity is a government, government a government program or yeah. a, a government job. Yeah. All right. Well, th- dude, this has been great. I don't have all the time in the world, but we really appreciate it because uh, hearing from you, I think, is a different perspective on on reality, right? Because I think I look at it completely different. I don't see things as you see them because of your experience, especially with lawmaking in general and that process. 
uh, but also understanding free market uh, principles at the level that, that you do. Uh, capitalism, I would say, is, uh, is really interesting because we've never had pure free market capitalism yeah. in anything. There's always been in uh, modern society some element uh, of, of government, right? Uh, and, and policing to, to an extent. Uh, and, and not just protecting human rights. At the same time, you look at just the capitalism principles creating an environment in which people can, in, can innovate uh, and, and not have this you know, oversight or, or scrutiny in what they're trying to do. Mm. It's, it's beautiful to see just all the things that have, have happened in, in our lives, right? Whether it's yeah. the technology in our cars or on our phones or in our computers. And uh, you know, I think the more freedom, the more freedom that we advocate, the the better the innovation is going to be, and the better the lives of uh, our lives are going to be. Um, well, maybe end end with this. I mean, maybe talk about what you what you see as the the future of just you know lawmaking, mar- you know markets and and society. Like, how do you feel things are are going just in general? So I, I think that anyone who cares about capitalism has to care about politics. You have to care about human psychology. They're, they're so inherently connected. You, you can't succeed in life financially if you don't understand how the system works. I mean, it's like getting out the, the, the chess board and all the pieces are laid out and you think it's a checkers game, right? Yeah. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hop over here. Like, you have to understand the rules of the game. And as sad as it is, politics inherently is connected to the system of capitalism that we have or the you know, partial capitalism or whatever you want to call it. And so that's the downside and the opportunity that I see that a lot of people disconnect the two and they don't realize that if we're going to be successful and have a, a true market economy or, or whatever degree that we can, we have to get involved politically. At a minimum, we have to be aware politically to know kind of where the currents are going and what to do. But either get involved, support someone else who is, who's effective in your state or the national level, uh, because as great as it is to just go try and make money and grow our businesses, and that's all very important, we have to also be playing defense and offense against the forces that are trying to undermine what we've protected and what we've built. Um, you look at the rise of AOC and still Bernie to these days, and and you know the popularity of the, on the rise of uh, democratic socialism from people who don't even understand the implications of what that term even means, and uh, and and there's opportunity or good reason I should say. Uh, to be a little fearful of the future from a capitalist perspective and what that means. Um, so I think we can't just uh, not care and ignore it and think it'll go away. We have to confront the fact that um, the, the market and uh, the government are, are very joined at the hip. <clears throat> so we need to know what to do about it. And I think that's the pitch I would make to, to your listeners is to figure out in their path of life with their unique skill sets and interests how to get involved, how to make a difference. because. Uh, we need all the, the the manpower that we can get. So I think what Libertas is doing in in Utah, there are other organizations uh, that are. Can I mention that? Please. So so in whatever state uh, you, dear listener, are in, I would invite you to go to spn.org. This stands for the State Policy Network, and it's kind of like an umbrella association for all the different free market think tanks across the country. Every state has at least one. Some have more than one. Um, And so whatever state you're in, if you want to see who's in your backyard working in the trenches, and I promise you that they're having more success than any of the national groups are are doing. It's so hard to get national reform, but there's so much opportunity at a local local level level. where the rubber meets the road. And these are the guys in the trenches working on free market stuff in your community. SPN.org is where you can find them. Because that's the... You know, that's that's the thing. It's like even doing like interviews like this. I mean, obviously, you have made some uh, you know, have been influential outside of Utah, Tuttle Twins. But I know you all you've written a bunch of op eds for, mm-hmm. you know, nationwide uh, newspapers. Uh, plus, you've gotten a lot of, you know, uh, press with some of the things that you I think the digital privacy one is one I re- re- remember. Yeah. Where I think we were the first wasn't Utah one of the first states to pass some. We are the first state. Oh, really? Yeah. So it's so it's one of those things where with with Connor, whether it's me following him on social media or it's sharing some of his thoughts, because uh, I talk, you know, oftentimes with with people and mention the Tuttle Twins books and give give them away. You can have a very similar uh, impact, whether it's through following these organizations, supporting them financially, uh, but also sharing thoughts and sharing ideas. Uh, I'd also say Tuttle Twins is an incredible way to learn about free market principles from a number of different angles uh, because 
teaching your children about it through those children's books, man, it's just, it's a, it's incredible, yeah. right? That breaking it down to that fundamental level, you know, just really solidifies that, that theory and that principle in your mind. Uh, but, but Connor, yeah, we'll post all of this on, uh, on the show notes and push it through social, social media so that the other organizations uh, can get some uh, publicity and obviously, and, and some support Great, because yeah, I know that you're making a huge difference here, but as our society just continues to progress at a, or grow at a very, you know, interesting, very quick rate and not, uh, as you mentioned, you know, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, I mean, you, you have some very radical ideas, okay, that are manifesting and because of good marketing, because of, you know, good influential tactics are gaining steam, yep. right? And, and understanding really what those things mean uh, as it relates to our, our future is important. And so I know, I understand that we don't have, I, know I don't have time during the day uh, to, write the way you do or to you know do videos or to lobby you know lobby legislative sessions but there are organizations out there that are passionate about doing totally. it like it's yours. division of labor yes. right we can't all do the same thing so yep. we can support one another in our different paths so what are what are the best ways to uh, follow uh, your organizations so our website is libertasutah.org um, the Tuttle Twins books our combo deal with all the discounts and workbooks we throw in is at tuttletwins.com and if any of your listeners want to follow me or find out about me, just Google Connor Boyack and I'm very easily discoverable. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Well, Connor, thanks again. Appreciate it. Thanks for having and, me. And uh, thanks everyone for uh, watching or listening. And uh, we'll see you next time.